Well, hello, good morning to everyone and good afternoon if you're joining us from the East Coast. Thank you for joining us today. We have a great webinar, Relational Competency in Action, Strategies for Everyday Advising. So as you come in, please do um, put your name in the institution you represent in the chat. We would like to see who all is here. This webinar is being recorded. I will send out the recording to you. We have Savannah Stay here. Good morning. We have Texas A&M International. We have Tuskegee. Hi, Tuskegee. Trenum State. Lawson. Concordia. Miles. Thank you guys for joining. Mm -hmm. There will be a short a uh, survey after the webinar that will pop up at the end. So if you would take time to complete that survey, we would truly appreciate it. Bishop State, welcome. We're gonna allow, I say a couple more minutes, if that for others to come in. And in the meantime, while we're doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce, introduce our, speaker our speaker today, our very own Dr. Marisol Garza. Uh, Marisol currently serves as an institutional support consultant for Trellis. In this role, she helps minority-serving institutions implement strategies to maximize student support. As a first-generation Latin Latino student in community college and community college graduate, her work is driven by her personal experience and centers on examining educational systems, practices, and process to advance equity, strengthen transfer pathways, and facilitate educational attainment for minoritized students. Marisol earned an AA from Lone Star College, a BS in psychology from the University of Houston, and an MED um, in counseling and guidance from Texas State University. She also earned a PhD in educational leadership and policy from the University of Texas at Austin, during which doctoral research examined academic advising strategies for Latinx community college students. Welcome, Marisol. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you, Teresa. I always feel bad when people read my bio because I'm like, <laughs> dang, that's a little long. <laughs> And I shortened it, so it was longer than that. <laughs> but it's a great bio. So we do have uh, Degaldo Community College have come in as well. So again, welcome everybody. We're very, very happy that you joined us today. I'm excited, y'all. Thank you for joining. Go ahead and get started. I'll just do a little more talking while we give people uh, an opportunity to log in. So as Teresa said, my name is Marisol Garza. I have... Uh, been in this higher ed game for a while. I do a lot of things. I've done a lot of things, but most of my 20 year career has been dedicated to academic advising in a one way financial aid office at one of the Lone Star Colleges, then got hooked into being an academic advisor. And then I was just hooked into higher ed from that point forward. So after academic advising, I did different things in organizational development, um, recruitment, outreach. I've served as an associate dean over all those departments and student services. And I've also served as a um, program manager for academic advising at a large multi-campus institution with over 140 academic advisors. I've done several advising trainings, and a lot of my research really digs into academic advising. So that's what brings me here. Advising is really my passion, my focus. This is where all my energy has been dedicated for most of my career. So today, what we're talking about is relational advising. And we may have heard relational advising, especially if you are currently an academic advisor and you're in the scene, engaging in the discussions, there's been a huge shift over the past few years to move from advising practices that are more transactional to advising practices that generate more engagement, that are actually more focused on the advising relationship. So where I'm going today and where I'm drawing from are the Nakata core competencies. And I'll briefly just kind of discuss um, the three core competencies, conceptual, 
is that learning, that understanding that we have of academic advising from a theoretical perspective, different advising theories, models, approaches, and also the kind of student development psychosocial theories that underpin them. We are not talking about conceptual models of advising today. Um, that's usually something that occurs at your campus, something that maybe you even have to do on your own. Informational is all of the information that pertains to your institution, uh, your degree requirements, your processes, your procedures, everything that you need to know to accomplish your goals at an institution. Typically, training in academic advising usually centers more on the informational competency at an institution, where we do spend a lot of time teaching advisors how to engage in an advising session, how to work a specific program, whether it's PeopleSoft, Banner, how to document, how to read and create a degree plan. That's also not what we're talking about today, but I want you to just kind of see that these all make up academic advising. What we're focusing on today is the relational component of academic advising. And this has to do a lot more with how we actually engage with students. So I wanna make something pretty clear as we dive into this work. And that is the difference between relational competence and relational advising. So as we've gone through these changes over the past few years, we've seen many institutions invest heavily in reorganizing and restructuring their academic advising programs. That's often included things like moving to um, a relational advising model, an appreciative advising model, a coaching model. There's all these different kind of models that have been introduced and institutions have been moving towards these, making the changes necessary. We've seen a rise in case management, a rise in proactive or intrusive advising, all with the goal to move away from transactional advising, where we're really just sitting there to accomplish a goal. And usually that goal is to get students registered for classes. Competency is not a model in and of itself. What we're really talking about and what I really wanna bring forth today is how we can bring some of these strategies that pertain to relational advising into our everyday interactions, whether you are a proactive institution, an appreciative advising institution, whatever model you subscribe to, there is a way to really maximize that relational competency. And we're gonna talk about what that is, what it looks like and how you can bring that forward in your advising sessions on a daily basis. Because honestly, and I wanna be frank here in having this discussion and this conversation with you, honestly, making these changes at our institutions to completely revamp and reorganize our advising structures and programs is a huge undertaking. They often take years to fully scale. And in the meantime, advisors still have a job to do. The job keeps going forward. And we can't really afford to neglect our students because we're waiting for a program to fully re become realized. We just can't. We're at that point where we understand in academic advising that those relationships matter, how we engage with students matter. And we just can't sit back and wait for everything to come full scale. We've got to start practicing what we can when we can. And again, the reality of it is that a lot of our institutions still utilize some form of advising model that is heavily transactional, especially depending on registration flow. There is a goal to accomplish. We're getting students registered. We're getting them set up on a degree plan and we're moving them forward. So sometimes we miss that opportunity to really engage. I also want to as we're going into this, I want to present 
and allow you to recognize that I'm well aware of the challenges we continue to face in academic advising as these changes are happening. Advisors, I've heard you for years. I have been one of them. I've been one of you. And I know that often we hear at institutions, anytime there's a change, anytime something happens, it's like, well, let's let the advisors do it. Advisors are gonna take on this task. So it's difficult in kind of that, that scene to manage all that. There's changing priorities. Responsibilities continue to expand. Sometimes they shrink. For institutions that are fortunate enough to be able to realize a caseload model, sometimes those caseloads keep growing. And we're always asking the question, what is an ideal caseload? NACADA can't help us answer that question because it's so complex. It depends on your institution, your goals, how it's organized. So sometimes we experience growing caseloads. We have some advisors that have as little as 120 students on their caseload and some that have as much as 2,200 students on their caseload. So that's a reality. Registration is ongoing. There's always some type of registration activity happening. This is especially true at community colleges that don't have a single start date. There's multiple start dates within a semester, which means advisors engaging in registration continues to move. There's also a tendency to experience staff turnover. Part of that is because of these challenges. Part of it is because there may be limited opportunities for growth within academic advising. There's many institutions I work with who have done an excellent job of creating ladders for their academic advisors to continue to grow professionally within their work. There's others that aren't fortunate enough to do that. So there's staff turnover. And again, we go back to that lack of upward career mobility within academic advising. These are challenges that are very real and I hear you. The other thing that I want <clears throat> to present and make sure that you know that I'm aware of is that academic advising has ebbs and flows. There are times where we can have that, you know, 15 to 30 minute advising session where we're taking a lot of time to meet with the students, really working in that relationship. But there are other times where we're engaging in peak registration and enrollment that we just can't do that. If we get five minutes with the student during that time, that's a good thing. But a lot of times we can't. We're just kind of, we're doing group advising. We're doing quick advising sessions just to do the bare minimum, ask some basic questions. Then when we go down into those ebbs at times, what are we doing? We're catching up on work. We're catching up on notes. We're paying attention to some of our external responsibilities. Maybe those have to do with recruitment. Maybe those have to do with being in a student club or organization. And then we also, like I said, have that time to actually engage in advising sessions. So there's ebbs and flows. And I say that because theoretically, we want to engage in academic advising in a way that's holistic, that's intentional, where we have 30 minutes to engage with the student. That's ideally what we want to do. The reality of it at our institutions is that that's just not the case. We don't always have that time. We don't always have that structure. We don't have that ability. So my purpose in having this discussion with you today or doing this presentation is to kind of give you some ideas on how we can put some relational competency strategies in action in everyday interactions, whether it's a five minute session or a 30 minute session. There is a way that you can begin to connect with students on a deeper level without really having to revamp everything and having to engage in those lengthy sessions. So according to Nakata, this is what relational competency is. It's articulating a personal philosophy of academic advising, creating rapport, building relationships, communicating in an inclusive, respectful manner, planning and conducting advising sessions, promoting students' understanding of logic and purpose of the curriculum. They do say that advising is teaching. So there is some sense of teaching that goes on in academic advising. Problem solving, decision making, meaning making, planning and goal setting, engaging in ongoing assessment and development of the self and the advising practice for you as an advisor. So this is a lot, right? This is a lot that we want advisors to accomplish. 
And it almost seems kind of insurmountable at times if we look at it, like how are we going to do all of these things with every single student and keep moving forward and making progress in our work? So I've tried to trim it down just a little bit on how we can do that by looking at relational competency in action. So I'm going to go over some of these with you right now, and then I'm going to go in depth for each of these areas to discuss what they look like in action and what are some strategies that you can use from each of these. So we're going to talk about critical reflection, practicing an ethic of care, inclusive and respectful communication and what that looks like, how to define and engage a successful advising session. We're also going to talk about how we strive for continued growth and building knowledge among students and how to help students engage in their own educational journey. And then how to continue to strive for personal growth in your profession for yourself, because that's essential, right? You bring yourself into this work. So going into the first one, when I talk about critical reflection, this is the first part of relational competency. And it's really thinking about what your role is and your purpose in, in advising and as an academic advisor. So I want you to think about as an advisor at your institution, what is your primary responsibility? Questions, when I ask this question, answers go all over the place. And by the way, this is actually a training that I do on campus. It's usually a lot more interactive. So I will be asking some kind of questions out in the universe that we're not really gonna engage in, but they're there. So what is your primary responsibility? Do you even know? Is that a discussion that you've had with your supervisors? And supervisors, are you communicating that to your team that you know right off the bat what the primary responsibility is? Because we can say the primary responsibility is advising students. Great. But what exactly does that mean? What does it look like? And then for advisors on a more personal level, as an academic advisor, what is your ultimate goal for advising? What do you wanna accomplish with students? And what kind of meaning does advising hold for you? Have you ever stopped to think about that? Have you ever asked yourself if advising holds any meaning for you? So for me, my journey into academic advising was really driven by the fact that I didn't have advising. I navigated a lot of those spaces on my own. As a first-generation college student, it was difficult. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just kind of flying blind, trying to figure it out as I went along. If I had had an advisor who cared to guide me, to show me the way, it may not have taken me nine years to get my associate degree, but it did. So for me, that's kind of the meaning that advising holds for me is to kind of help remove barriers for students, help them navigate spaces they may not know how to navigate and help them reach their ultimate goal. So what does that hold for you? Going in with a sense of purpose is the starting point. If you don't feel that sense of purpose going into your work, then that work is not gonna have meaning for you and it's not gonna carry out in a very intentional way. And then I want you to think about who do you serve and who do you see? And so I ask this question in trainings and I often hear things like, well, I serve first generation college students or I serve non-traditional college students, first time in college students, continuing college students. Inevitably, every time I ask this question, it kind of revolves around that and it revolves around a college student. Ultimately, it's a college student. So when you think about who you serve and who you see, at some point, I want you to take a minute to reflect and engage in critical reflection in a way that helps you explore what you bring to the table. How does your lived experience and your background influence your approach to engaging with students? What assumptions or biases are you bringing into the work? What learning or growth have you experienced that you can share? And how can, how can you use what you've learned in your work? There's a book I read called All About Love by Bell Hooks. And in that book, she talks about 
finding purpose in your work. Let's be honest. Let's be 100% honest and say, not many of us, I'll give credit somewhere out there. Maybe somebody as a child did say, I want to be an academic advisor when I grow up. But that's not something we ever set out to do, to think, I want to be an academic advisor when I grow up. It's something that presents itself as an opportunity. It's something we may land into. So it's important to connect with your work in a way that brings meaning to you. And that's how you infuse love into the work that you do. That's, you know, maybe a little touchy-feely for some, but honestly, it gives you more of a sense of purpose when you know why you're connecting. So again, think about who do you serve? And I want that question to kind of come up or that those answers to come up in your mind right now. Is it FTIC students? Is it sophomores? Is it a particular population? Is it trio students, adult learners, undergraduates, graduates? What does that look like? Who do you serve? And here's where I want to challenge you to remember that you serve humans first. Before any of these people walk through our doors, before they assume the identity of a student, they are a human. They have lives, they have needs, they have things going on outside that influence every choice that they've made in their life, including the choice to walk through the door at your institution. And when we fail to see the people sitting in front of us as humans first, we fail to acknowledge that what we say and what we do has an impact beyond selecting courses, beyond just checking some boxes, right? How many classes they enroll in is going to impact what they do with childcare. Can they afford childcare? Is that going to take away from their job? Do they have other responsibilities? Every decision we help them make has an impact on their actual lives. So we need to see them as humans. Also, every experience that they've had that they bring through the door impacts how that person is making decisions. The choices that they're making, the program that they choose to pursue. And I'm not asking you to be counselors. I'm not asking you to really do anything with that and try to solve all of their problems. I'm merely asking you to hold that awareness that you are dealing with a human, just as you're a human. You're not just an academic advisor. You are a human with your own lived experience, your own things that you bring into the work and how you present yourself is inclusive of everything that goes on in your life. <clears throat> so early on in my career, I was in an advising session and I was doing, doing my thing like we always did, right? You are helping the student choose classes. You're talking about, you know, you really should go full time if you want to finish on time. These are the things that you need to do. If you're going to take three, a three hour class or a three credit hour class, then you're going to need to dedicate at least, at least six hours outside of that time. I'm going through the whole spiel of everything that's expected of a student, everything we tell a student to do when we bombard them with information. This particular student this day looked at me square in the eyes and said, ma'am, you don't know me, you don't know my life. And I thought for a second, oh goodness, he is 100% correct. I am just following my spiel. I'm just throwing all these things at this person. And I never even stop to think about what barriers is he facing? Are there reasons he can't go full time? Are there reasons he can't study these many hours outside? Is there childcare? What is happening? I never stopped to think about that because I was so entrenched in going through my checklist and making sure that I got that job done that I never stopped to see the human. So from this point forward, my entire approach to how I engaged with students changed because I never wanted a student to feel like that again, to feel like I was just throwing things at them without acknowledging that they're humans. So I changed. 
And that's kind of a decision you need to make with for yourself as well. How are you viewing those students? And more importantly, how is your approach making them feel in that interaction? Again, whether it's a five minute interaction or a 30 minute interaction, how is your approach making them feel? So yeah, I don't ever wanna see this again, ever. And I try not to. So some of what I'm talking about today um, comes from research of articles that have been written, you know, the typical way we engage in research. But some of it comes from my own firsthand research interviewing college students on their experiences with academic advising. One of the things that continued to come up that was a theme that emerged over and over and over again is care. This idea of care. Students wanted to feel as if though their advisor cared. And digging in deeper, I wanted to understand, well, what does care look like for you? We talk about care all the time. We talk about a culture of care, being caring, caring enough to do your job, but really for, for the people that we're serving at the institution, for the people who have assumed this identity as a student, what does that look like? And so what I heard thing, were things like demonstrated investment. What the heck does that mean? Simply put, the student said, I had one advisor that really just seemed like she didn't like her job. She didn't want to be there. She was just doing it because she had to. This particular student that I have in mind switched advisors. And he said he noticed the difference immediately between the advisor that he felt just had no investment to the advisor that really did have an investment. And one of the key differences that he stated was that the second advisor simply started the advising session by asking a simple question. How are you doing? Whereas the first advisor asked the question, what can I help you with? Great intention. We're there to say, we're there to help, obviously. But for the student, it was more important that the advisor cared to understand how they were doing before getting down to business. And this came up over and over again. Some students said, a little warm up before we get down to business. Just be kind of friendly. Just be more open. Ask me questions about my success. Ask me questions about what I want to do. Just a demonstrated investment in the person. Being known to the advisor was important. And we can't do that in every scenario. I get that. Because we can't know 2,200 students, right? But that's where things like notes come in. The one thing that students mentioned is I hate having to repeat my story over and over again every time I meet with an advisor. It takes up time and I feel like I'm just telling my story to one more person that doesn't care that I'm probably never gonna see again. So when you can lean back and look at notes before your session or pick up on a couple of details about the student, even something as simple as knowing what their major is before they walk through your door, knowing their name and using their name is important professionalism. Students recognize professionalism. And they were very clear about the difference of what a professional advisor looked like and what a not very professional advisor looked like. And to them, a professional advisor was one who, A, was ready to meet with them. Two, knew most of the answers they needed but they were well aware that advisors have, I was so surprised actually, that they were well aware advisors have multiple responsibilities and were respectful of that. And they said, we know they can't know everything, but there were some advisors who admitted, I don't know that, but let me get you the answer. And there were other advisors who just said, basically, that's not me. That's my, not my department. You have to go find that somewhere else. And they recognized that as professionalism. Either you're going to do what you need to do to get me the answers and help me, 
or you're going to send me on my way somewhere else. They discussed warmth and friendliness in a session. Was the advisor smiling or demonstrating appropriate emotions for what was being discussed? Were they receptive to the student? And that ties into respect when it comes to being receptive. There were some students that said, you know, I had a plan. I had something that I wanted to do. I kind of knew the classes that I wanted to take. And my advisor kept pushing me to take more classes, kept pushing me to do something different and didn't hear me or what I wanted to do. And to them, that demonstrated a lack of respect for their ideas, for their goals, for their purpose in being there. Support was important and they the support came in the form of validation validation validating the student's goals validate validating their reason for being there and that meant a lot to them when an advisor kind of just gave them a little extra kudos for saying this is a great major i think it's a good fit for you you're you understand what this major is going to entail You've done your homework about this, validating kind of what they've done and what they've been through. And again, we go back to understanding, understanding their experience. Maybe they can't take 12 or 15 hours. Maybe they can only take three or six. And that has to be okay. I know, you know, college administrators are always probably going to be like, no, they have to take 15 hours. We need 15 to finish. But honestly, we have to take a moment and think the lives that our students live and what's going on in their lives. And we have to strive to understand that. We have to strive to understand their experiences. Have they been marginalized? Have they experienced discrimination? Have they been told for most of their lives that college was not for them or that they sucked at math or things like that? What narratives have been perpetuated among the students? that may be holding them back or may be generating fear. We have to strive to understand those things. Again, I'm not asking you to be a counselor. I'm not asking you to solve these problems. I'm just asking you to be aware that we all have experiences that we bring in to everything we do. And we strive to understand that. So how do we begin to engage this ethic of care? Shift your mindset, number one. You shift your mindset. You think that you are engaging with a human with lived experiences. And you see that person first. That's how we start. And then you engage the human. Start your session in a warm, friendly manner. It's not going to take a whole lot of time to simply ask, how are you today? Or say something like, I'm so glad you took the time to be here with me today. This is an important step in your journey. Validating even the step that they took to get there. Because for some students, even making the decision to go meet with an advisor is a huge step. They don't want to do that for various reasons, for fear, some of them for shame. But they go because they have to. They go because they're told it's a step you know, they have to take to continue college. Sometimes they may be stepping into our offices full of fear and anxiety. And then we just hit them and bombard them with all this other information they need to know before just kind of saying, hey, thank you for being here. Strive to understand, practice empathy. We may not have the same experiences as our students. Maybe we do. Either way, we want to strive to understand and to empathize with whatever they're feeling. Um, There was an article that came out recently that looked at process maps for academic advising, and it showed kind of what we as administrators, as college and university leaders think is happening with a student at each phase, and then kind of what the students said. And so as we're outlining checklists that students need to complete and steps they need to take, students are saying... I'm experiencing a lot of fear. 
I'm anxious, I'm confused, I'm unsure. So we need to understand and appreciate that because we're used to this. We live in this world. Many of us have, you know, higher education beyond undergraduate. We've been around the block. We live in this work. We understand it. It's what we do every day. For those new humans walking through our door, especially, especially the ones who are first generation, this is a completely foreign world to them. And they're coming from maybe a high school where they had a counselor kind of doing all these things for them. And I challenge you here, there are two schools of thought in this. And I've worked with many advisors across many institutions. And there's one school of thought where people are adamant on this idea of, oh, well, they're college students now, they're adults, they need to figure it out. So they're on their own. Then there's this other school of thought that's like, okay, we need to do everything for them because they know nothing. We are striving to find some balance in the middle to acknowledge that although they may have some understanding of college and college processes, maybe they have family that have helped them, they have not gone through this experience themselves. Yet, this may be their first time going through this college journey. So we're mindful of that. At the same time, we can't just throw them in the deep end and expect them to figure it out. Because it is their first time going through it. So our goal is not to do everything for them and hold their hand through everything. It's also not to throw them in the deep end. It's being able to recognize the type of support that a student needs and offering that support with the ultimate goal of building mastery and competency in that student so that they learn to navigate themselves. But we have to start somewhere and we have to start together. And so that's another thing that I close out with here is engaging that ethic, ethic of care means providing reassurance of support, letting that student know that if they have questions, if they get stuck, if they need another little helping hand, that you will still be there. You're not just going to hand them instructions on how to go register online and then expect them to figure out the rest of their journey. You can hand them the instructions. This is how you register online. If you get stuck or have any other questions, I'm here to help. It's simple. You don't have to take a whole lot of time in that moment to walk them through anything. You don't have to take a lot of time in that moment to get them registered or to walk them through that process. You can give them the guidance and then reassure them that you're still gonna be there to help. Then we wanna practice using inclusive and respectful communication. Like I said, use their name. That mattered to students. Even when students understood that, um, you know, they were getting kind of a mass message that was mail merged with their name and just the, the little filler box. It mattered to them that it said their name. So if you're even sending an email, a message, a text to students, use their name. It matters. They really feel like that message is just for them. Ask, don't assume. I say this in things like if you see a student or if you hear a student that mentions that they're married, don't automatically assume that it's a husband or a wife because of their gender. Use a kind of generic term like spouse unless they give you information otherwise. And if you're not clear on something, ask. If you can't pronounce their name, that's okay. Just ask. Can you tell me how to pronounce your name properly? I don't want to mess it up. Or is there another name you prefer to be called? Ask. They will tell you and they also value the fact that you're even asking. Work to recognize your unconscious bias. What are you seeing? How is that affecting your lens? Importantly, be authentic. This is some of the information I get back from advisors is like, well, this isn't how I am naturally. Like I'm just not a warm person or I just don't engage that way. It is important to be authentic. 
you have to be yourself and show up as yourself. But it's also important to develop skills that help you engage in a more relational way. It's an intentional move that we make to grow in that way. Always listen attentively. Look for cues for the student. I, when I do a presentation for students, I give the um, kind of analogy that in this texting world we have, and we send a text message to students, or we send a text message to anybody, and we see the three dots come across, we have an idea that the person is typing, they're thinking. So we're waiting for that response. And then once we get that response, then we respond and the other person sees three dots. In face-to-face -face communication, we don't have three dots above our head saying I'm thinking or I'm typing. You kind of have to look for cues. And I've seen this happen over and over and over again where people are just coming at students with overload information, just coming at them saying this, 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 and this, this checkbox, this list, this, that, without ever really looking at the student to tune into whether or not that student has heard what you've said, whether they've processed what you've said. So look for that. Look for a, an affirmation from them, nodding their head, saying, yes, I got it. And if you don't hear that, ask for it. Make sure that what you're saying is landing. And then to kind of ease tension in the session, I say practice mirroring. And if you don't know what mirroring is, is if, you know, the student kind of has their head tilted as they're talking to you, maybe you want to tilt your head a little bit. Um, you don't want to exaggerate mirroring. Like if they're sitting in front of you like this, you don't necessarily want to go like that. But if they're smiling, you try smiling. If you notice that their, their kind of disposition is a little calmer, a little more downplayed, then practice that as well. If they're sitting up, you sit up. If they're sitting a little back, you sit a little back. This is a, an empathic approach to engagement that just eases the tension and allows the person to feel more connected with you. So as you can see in that regard, you don't have to completely revamp your advising session. You just have to kind of do a little something to make your interaction a little warmer. Then we talk about define and engage in a successful advising session. And I cannot tell you what this looks like because your institution is different. Every institution is different. But as you're doing this, you want to understand what are the top three goals of advising at your institution? I am so surprised all the time when I ask this question and I can't really get an answer for that because it's not a discussion that has really been had. So supervisors out there, I encourage you to think through this and discuss this with your team. What are the top three goals of advising at your institution? And then as an advisor, what are your goals? What do you wanna accomplish in that session? And then you wanna look at what you've written, what you've discussed, and then prioritize. So if you're in an advising session, an ideal 30-minute session, you want to accomplish these four goals. Now, if you have a five-minute session, what are the most important goals that you want to accomplish in that session? Then go back and check your goals. Is there at least one interpersonal goal? There should be at least one. And that can be, like I said, as simple as saying, how are you? Is there an engagement goal? to get that student kind of engaged, give them some work, some follow-up, something that helps them engage in their journey. And then are all the goals required? Or again, did you prioritize? After an advising session or two, and you can do this randomly, review and kind of check yourself. How many of those goals did you accomplish? Did you meet the student's immediate needs? Did you help the student build new knowledge? So like I said, it's going to be different at every institution. Every institution has a different set of priorities, a different structure. The important thing is to engage in these discussions. And I also encourage you as academic advisors and supervisors out there, hear this too. I encourage you as academic advisors to meet with your colleagues without supervisors or managers present. 
So a more informal meeting where you can meet with your colleagues and discuss some of these things openly. Discuss, you know, some of your challenges, some of your fears, your successes, what's working, what's not working. There is a time for supervisors and managers to play a role in this process, but sometimes we just need to get with our colleagues to have those discussions. I'm fortunate enough, my colleagues and I, we do this. We occasionally have a huddle and we get together and we just discuss our own things and our own ideas. And sometimes we come up with things that we wanna bring forward to our supervisor. Sometimes we just need to vent and help each other. So I encourage you to do that as you're going through this process. Then we talk about engaging students. And so again, this is um, something that came up in my research. How do students like to be engaged? And we go back to the same thing as caring. They want you to demonstrate genuine interest. They want you to demonstrate warmth. And like I said, that's simple as a question. It's as simple as uh, affirming their deci decision to be there. Knowing their name, having their history. If you can review the history before the session, know a little bit about why they're there. If you're not the same advisor that they saw last time, you know, what notes did that advisor make? Are there any things you should pick up on? Was there any tasks provided to the student that you need to follow up on? Know that history so that the student isn't having to repeat that over and over and over again. We already discussed personalized communication. And another one <clears throat> that kind of stood out to me was that Students enjoyed seeing their academic advisor at campus activities just randomly. They appreciated how much they enjoyed seeing their advisor just out at a student life event, at any activity, at club rush or whatever is going on. To them, it felt as if though their advisor cared because they were invested and they were doing the things that they were asking the students to do. So advisors are telling students, participate in clubs and organizations, get involved on campus, get engaged. So when you see the advisors out there doing that, that shows students, hey, look, they're doing it too. They're here, they're doing what they told me to do. And that meant a lot. <clears throat> so in looking at how we specifically nurture engagement, I want to encourage you to create a welcoming space. And I know this is hard. Um, this came out in the interviews. This has come out in research. When a student walks into your office and your desk is covered in papers and you have stacks here and stacks there, and it's a kind of chaos, the students get that sense of chaos. And I met with one institution who did a survey of their students and, and they actually found that students didn't have a lot of confidence. And that's exactly what they said. They said, how can I expect this particular office to handle my paperwork and do things for me if they can't even maintain their office in an organized fashion? Students notice every little thing like that. Also, maybe put some personalized things up that convey something about you. Do you participate in an organization? Are you an ally? Do you have some kind of ally system or program at your institution, you know, put that up there. Have you been to campus events? Have you taken pictures with the, um, you know, mascot? Put things that say a little bit about you so that they can recognize and see you as a human, not just some person there telling them what to do. I always say reset. So before you move on to the next student, even if you're in a mad dash and you only have 30 seconds to get to the next student, just take a few breaths, clear notes or items from the prior session. So finish inputting those notes real quick, get them out of the way. If you've written some things down, put them in a place you can go back to later. Prepare for the next student. If you can review that student's record, review notes, and prepare follow-up questions. So if the previous advisor, and so this goes back to make sure you're making good notes. If the previous advisor said that they gave student the students a task of finding two organizations to participate with, did they do that? Follow up on that. And again, always welcome and thank you. Welcome for being here. Thank you for taking the step at the end. Thank you for spending time with me. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for showing up for yourself. And then show up, be present, 
be there with the student that you're meeting with, your whole self. Do not multitask. It's already been proven that multitasking is kind of a fallacy. We still all do it, but it's a fallacy. So please don't be checking email as your student is talking to you or kind of randomly looking at other notes and thinking about things that you have to do later while a student is there with you. Be present in that moment 100% with that student. Then I say strive for continued growth. Most importantly here is understand that students have different levels of knowledge and understanding. Some students maybe have some background with college, some experience, maybe this is their second time returning to college, maybe they have family that have helped them. So don't always be ready to start from the basics. Like I did with that one student I told you where I was just giving them the spiel, going through my checklist, doing everything I had to do without taking time to really acknowledge where the student is. And so some of this can be accomplished by asking some open-ended questions. So be curious. Tell me a little bit about your experience so far. Tell me about the steps you took before meeting with me. That gives you an idea of what they've done so far. Have they already completed all of their enrollment steps? Did they submit things? Have they already tried to register for classes and maybe were not successful? Did they register for classes and are thinking about changing? Instead of asking students, what do you need or what can I help you with? Because often students may not know exactly what they need. You can ask them something like, tell me about the steps that you took before meeting with me. And that gives you an idea of what where they're at. Based on the goals of the session, um, think about ways that you can kind of understand their identity and build on knowledge gaps that are there. So does the student have any prior education? Have they received guidance elsewhere? And a lot of times if you ask, students will tell you, yes, this other person was helping me. The person in admissions helped me get this far. Check for misinformation. In asking some of these questions, you know, has the student been given misinformation? Sometimes it's misinformation about what classes you can take together, how many hours you can enroll in, things about, I don't qualify for financial aid. Just kind of check in and see if there's any information that that's misinformation that that student is working from. And think about what questions a student may not be asking that you know are important. And so that's why I say here we're striving for continued growth and building knowledge on an individual level. You want to identify those knowledge gaps and you want to give students the capacity to continue building from where they are. And help students engage in their journey. How do we do that? Again, we're using open-ended questions. I know, Teresa, I'm getting to the end. <laughs> Use open-ended questions to encourage reflection, you know, for students, ask them, you know, we've had a lot of reflective questions for us, but what about the students? Give them a task. Next time we meet, I'd like to know a little bit more about why you chose this particular career or this particular major. Understand that. Assign them tasks that help them build knowledge and competency. So, Sending a student off to engage in the enrollment process themselves, that's building knowledge they may not have. And again, you do that in a supportive way. Encourage students to seek opportunities on campuses, whether that's employment opportunities, internships, different organizations, activities, volunteer opportunities. Also refer them to college clubs, organizations, and activities. And show up, be there, be a surprise. Be there. And finally, I go back to you as the academic advisors um, because you have a lot. A lot is on your shoulders. Academic advising has continuously come up in research as one of the most critical student services on a college campus. Students recognize the importance, institutional leaders recognize the importance. And with that, you have a lot on your shoulders. I recognize that I've been there. So tap into your purpose, engage in that critical reflection often, whether it's tapping into that purpose or understanding if you've accomplished your goals in the session, 
If you're accomplishing your goals overall in advising, take time to reflect. Collaborate. Like I said, meet with your team. Brainstorm. Come up with ideas. How can you support each other? What can you do for each other? Do you need to request something specifically? Continued growth. Engage in the work. Engage in the research. Have the discussions. There's different things that you can try here. Sometimes professional development budgets are limited. Talk to your supervisors. Maybe y'all can take turns. We've done uh, team teaching where every month one person takes on a topic, learns all about it, and then comes back and teaches the rest, right? We do that often. Maybe you can do something like that. Engage in these types of webinars. Either way, you want to continue to grow professionally and personally. And then practice self-care. This job gets hard. And I think it's underestimated how hard it gets. We're under pressure for enrollment. We're under pressure to do things quickly, to meet with a certain number of students, to reach out to students who may be struggling, to respond to early alerts. There's a lot that we do. So practice self-care. And advising supervisors and managers out there, I encourage you to build self-care into the work. Take a half day, you know, take an hour out of a Friday or whenever you have time. I know we always, we often make time for some type of professional development. We don't often make time for self-care. We had a really fun experience here where one of our colleagues came into one of our sessions and talked about breathing techniques, you know, and how to kind of recenter us. And that was very powerful for us, right? So something as simple as that, you know, bring in a guest speaker, talk to maybe the counselors on campus. Can they share some self-care techniques with your team? And put that into action. Honor and recognize that the role that advisors play is critical, important, and it's heavy. So advisors need to be their best in order to serve students at the highest level possible. And so with that, that is all that I have. If you have any questions during these last couple of minutes, please feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Maybe pop it into the chat. I'd love to hear your questions. And again, I didn't really mention it, but this training and another training um, are available. I'm happy to visit your campus and engage in some of this work with you. I'm engaging in some campuses right now as they're developing their new hybrid advising program. It's very exciting work. I love it. So thank you, Marisol. Yeah, you have some great comments in the in the um in the chat. A lot of people found this very helpful. I did too. I think it was a great uh webinar. I, I'm still honed in on the notes section, you know, because it is, you know, I get to see myself when I'm calling, you know, customer service at a place and I've called to let them know an issue that I'm having. And it took me a while to get to a rep and then I give them my information. And then for one of one reason or another, maybe the phone get disconnected or I have to call back. And then there's no notes and I have to start all over again. So that is irritating. So I do agree with the notes. And, and we have some great comments, like I said, in the chat, just different uh, systems that some of our institutions are using for um, the note sections. And so really, really good. Absolutely. Um, there's a somebody made a comment that if, if they could share this with their staff and other directors within the system, absolutely. Once the recording is available, it's available for anybody at your institution to view. And again, if you want to dig in a little more, I'm happy to visit your campus. Any Anytime I can engage in academic advising, I'm happy to do that. So whether I'm your institutional support consultant or not, I'll still go. Uh, and the recording, I hope to get it out to you soon. I have to send it to our communications department. They kind of do their little editing. And then once it becomes available, I promise I will send it out. Um, and for you who are still on, just remember, we do have a short survey that will pop up after this webinar. If you can um, complete that, we'll be very, very grateful. And we'll thank you so much. Um, Marisol, I'll leave it up to you to end if there's no more questions. 
I think we're good. Thank you so much for taking time today. I know that even taking an hour out of your day can be taxing sometimes. Sometimes we give up our lunch for these things. So thank you because this is an investment in yourself and you've already taken a step forward, right? So with that, Teresa, I think we can say goodbye to everybody. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.